role at the farm when we moved up here was a lot about helping the individual businesses, um, you know, be successful. The the farm was sort of an overarching brand and and, and business, but all of the entities on the site are up here in Byron were running their own business. So I spent a lot of time coaching and helping, you know, businesses, um, you know, uh, succeed because that was the, the the outcome of the actual farm was was predicated off the success of all the, the micro business. Good morning and welcome to another edition of Better Business, Better Life. Today I am joined by fellow EOS implementer Ryan Sharpley, who is based up in Byron Bay, which is a beautiful part of the world over in Australia. And Ryan is um, the founder of Purpose People, which is all about helping people lead their best lives. Uh, But before that, he has been a business owner for quite some years. So Ryan, welcome to the show. Thanks, Deborah. Thanks for having me today. Oh, absolute pleasure. So I'd, I would love the people to hear your story because it's not a straight line journey, is it? So tell us a little bit about, you know, how where you've come from, where you are today, and I guess also what you're most proud of in that journey as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we uh, have had a bit of a, a, not a straight line to uh, get us uh, living in Byron Bay as a family. Um, we're originally out of Melbourne. Um, we moved up to Byron half a dozen years ago after running yeah, and owning a, a few different businesses in, in Melbourne. Our, the business that we really cut our teeth in was a manufacturing business uh, in, in Melbourne. We ran that business or worked in that business for a dozen or so years, and that was in uh, printing. So I used to look after the technology and the customer service and logistics area of those uh, business. And, uh, yeah, through that time, um, yeah, we started in the late 90s. It was, uh, I suppose, the story of it was an industry that needed a little bit of a shift. So we you know, had the opportunity to create a greenfield site. So we had all the new and shiny and toys that allowed us to uh, you know, have great quality, um, great customer service and sort of bring that as a new offering into the actual market. And the business grew really quickly. Uh, what we found over that, we were all quite young and enthusiastic and, you know, there was more sort of opportunities and growth that we could really, you know, handle at the time. So we just kept on sort of crawling back and keeping that uh, growing as we went along. Um, what we, we did notice over a period of time was the, you know, the, the systems and structure that we sort of kept on having to reintroduce and, and build out the um for the, uh, the business to grow, uh, it was a yeah, bit of a challenging period running through GFC, et cetera. We were printing retail catalogues and magazines. So, you know, the customer demands were, you know, pretty intensive. And, uh, yeah, over over time we, um, you know, got to a stage that it was a, yeah, great business. We, you know, so people get married and you know, it was a real sort of family, you know, orientated business. And, uh, yeah, that was really the... Um, I suppose, the start of our uh, business journey primarily. Fantastic. And so you moved on from there. So what, what happened? Yeah, so I, I went back and studied in, what was that, 2010-11? Uh, it seems like a bit of a, a blur. We had uh, three young kids um, and I was really looking at what was sort of, how do I start to formalise some of the skills that we were actually using within the printing business? So I went back and um, yeah, did a master's, which was great. And it was, a, I suppose, the, the eye-opening sort of aspects of, you know, being amongst 30 or, you know, 35 peers of, you know, across different industries. And, you know, um, I look back now and I, it was really a bit of an eye-opening sort of perspective because I did have blinkers on, you know. The whole world revolved around our business that we've been involved in and, and just being exposed to so many other uh, people in different industries and professions. Um, that sort of led me to, to think about what was next for us as a, as a family, but also me as a professional as well. So through that time, I started working with a mentor and we you know, started to craft a bit of a plan to look about what was next out of the, the printing industry. I'd always been in technology and design. And uh, yeah, through that was, you know, got to a stage that it probably wasn't as fulfilling as what I had hoped for you know, after that period of time and started to explore other options. And, you know, from that led the, uh, I suppose, the realisation of that sort of deep connection to community and, and people was probably the part that was lacking. So working on a bit of a, a plan to actually get out of um, the business um, and, you know, maybe develop a business that was a bit more sort of family orientated or owned and operated. Um, and that's coincidentally what we did. 
So what was it you went into? Because it was quite different from printing, right? <laughs> yeah, completely different, absolutely. So it was a uh, not quite the Matt Damon border zoo, but we, uh, <laughs> we ended up buying a farm down on the peninsula in Melbourne and there was a wow. small produce farm and have never grown any food or produce, you know, uh, commercially. We, we'd had an interest in food and, and community, obviously, but we had never grown anything, you know, for a living. Um, so it was a bit of a vertical learning curve. But, yeah, we found a little property on the peninsula and, yeah, um, bought that and moved moved down there. So it was a bit of a quirky uh, sort of little business. It had a 100-year-old uh, train carriage on the site, which was the actual yeah. shop. So that was where people would come in and buy their produce on weekends uh, and the grounds were sort of exceptional. The previous owners were botanists, so, you know, it was like walking around, a, you know, botanical gardens, which is what we sort of fell in love with to begin with. So the experience that people would have that they would come in and walk around the gardens and, you know, we had goats, pigs, chickens, you know, all sorts of animals uh, running around and uh, then they'd, um, yeah, buy their produce. We'd grow that in, on our property but also aggregate it within the, the local farms um, uh, on the peninsula. And then over yeah, a handful of years, um, that business sort of grew. We developed a um, food providing business where we were selling um, food into restaurants. Um, we had a mushroom growing business as well, or sort of urban mushrooms where we'd grow different types of mushrooms. We had aquaponics, education, all these sort of little aspects that sort of were interrelated. And uh, yeah, it was a great experience. Um, but that's where we sort of uh, shifted out of after the printing business, which was a, yeah, not a straight line, you know, if you think back from uh, IT and transport through to, yes. you know, growing vegetables. There's, there's nothing that's uh, similar other than, you know, I suppose the, the systems and processes, but, uh, yeah, completely different, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it is funny, isn't it? I mean, I've worked in many different industries myself and, and although every industry is quite unique, the, the general... Um, business principles still remain the same, right? You need no. to have the right people, you need to have the right process, all that sort of thing, no matter right. what you do. Very yeah. true. So, but that was, sorry, that was Melbourne. So how did we get to Byron Bay? Yeah, so um, that was in Melbourne. We we shared our stories on, on socials. This is sort of at the, you know, the start of Facebook sort of marketing and we were quite open and, and transparent with our, you know, triumphs and tribulations, you know, on the, uh, on the farm and, um, probably more um, yeah, challenges than, than, than triumphs, in all honesty, given the, the learning that we're going through. And uh, there was a similar business up um, in the, called The Farm in Byron Bay, and the, the owners of the farm uh, saw sort of what we were doing on our socials and connected with us one day. And, yeah, we uh, sort of decided to join forces, and the farm was a, a larger sort of version of what we are doing in Melbourne um, that they had a restaurant, bakery and other sort of more substantial businesses running on the premises. We're a, a junior version of what, uh, you know, is up here and um, got to know uh, Tom and Emma who were the owners of, of that business and, yeah, it was the right time. We'd sort of, I suppose, a serial entrepreneur, we'd grown what we could down in Melbourne and we're looking for our next adventure. So uh, it was the right time with the the kids. We're still in, in primary school, so we decided to... Uh, Tom said, you know, come up and, and, you know, let's join forces and see what we can do together up here. So it was a great time to sort of shift the kids and, and move up into this region, which we, you know, honeymooned and holidayed up here before. So um, a bit of an adventure to actually uh, to live up here, which we did. Oh, cool. And so EOS, so you're now um, an EOS implementer. Tell me how you came across EOS and what was it that actually appealed yeah. to you about it? Yeah, so... Within uh, our printing business, one of the early um, implementers, uh, Dan Williams, was the CEO at the time of a, an IT business that helped us um, in our IT sort of capacity. Um, so I'd heard about this sort of, you know, orange magic, you know, uh, system that, uh, that that existed uh, way back when we were in our printing business and, and never really explored it other than just knowing about how much positive impact that had, that had within their business. Um my role at the farm when we moved up here was a lot about helping the individual businesses, um, you know, be successful. The, the farm was sort of an overarching brand and, and, and business, but all of the entities on the site are up here in Byron were running their own business. So I spent a lot of time coaching and helping, you know, businesses um, 
you know, uh, succeed because that was the, the the outcome of the actual farm was was predicated off the success of all the, the micro businesses. So mm-hmm. when um, the, the business was sold uh, up here, um, I was conscious to look to, you know, what did I actually love and enjoy doing, which, you know, was really helping people. Um, that was what I really uh, fulfilled me. So it was a combination of knowing about EOS from the, the printing days, working out that that desire to actually help business owners, you know, um, improve their business um, and and putting the two together. And and I was mm-hmm. conscious to look at a, a system or a process that was proven as well. Um, I've sort of experienced bad versions of, you know, I didn't want to be a, a consultant that was sort of the PowerPoint sort of person. I wanted to actually make, yes. uh, you know, meaningful change. And that's where um, I think this system um Seeing the results of what it had done with with businesses that I'd work with, um, that that's what made me sort of down the path, lead down the path of of EOS. Mm. So, looking back on the printing business, perhaps like what what would have been the, one of the tools that could have really helped in that business? One of the EOS tools. Well, it's hard to pick just one. Um, you know, mm. if I'm being honest, I will look at what we did with, um, you know. The, the structure and process, we went to the point of probably over systemizing um, and complicating the business. So, you know, we're an entrepreneurial size business of, you know, 140 to 150 people in the end. The systems and processes were needed to be there because of the actual, you know, um, consistency of the product. But we probably mm-hmm. went too far. Um, so, yeah, I think the whole um, system within EOS, the, the process component would have been a huge one. Um, the accountability chart, which is one of my favourites as far as providing clarity within people's roles, that would also have been, you know, we ran a traditional organisation chart, which, as you know, is completely different to a, uh, an accountability chart. Um, level 10 meetings, the meeting structure wasn't the same. So there was, I mean, I, I think back now, I wish I you could rewind time and, you know, know what you know now and actually, you know, reintroduce it back then. But, yeah, probably the... The accountability chart and the process component would be the two uh, key uh, aspects of the of the model we would have looked at. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So you're now working with a whole bunch of different businesses, helping them with EOS. Um, yeah. What do you sort of see in the people that you're working with? I mean, it, it sort of. I know that with the, the the companies I work with, often there's this sort of oh, it's the next bright shiny object, and it's only really when they start to get into using EOS on a regular basis they realise that actually this is this is a game changer, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think the biggest one that I've noticed um, starting with businesses is the transparency that it offers, the, you know, the mm-hmm. clarity within new teams or, you know, there's so many things that people probably know within their business, but it actually is like shining a light, um, you know, and starting solving those issues uh, once and for all as well. So, you know, the transparency and accountability, that's probably the biggest you know, feedback sort of piece that I get when starting within the journey. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of ideas that people have had that, you know, sort of they haven't been able to put into a form that they can communicate or or transpose. So they've had all of these ideas that sort of, you know, rattling around in their head and that sort of really focuses and puts them into a place where it it can be, you know, um, put into a a structure that sort of makes sense and and is communicable across the rest of the business. Mm. It's true. I've actually just been, the reason I'm in a different room today is I've actually just been um, privileged to sit through a level 10 meeting with one of my clients. And I'm actually sitting in, in their boardroom at the moment finishing off this podcast. But um, it was really great to see that they've now been doing this for a little bit over six months, I think. Yeah. And just that clarity that comes out of those level 10 meetings. Right. And, you know, they're actually getting through their issues. They've got things on track. They know exactly what they're being held accountable for with yeah. their scorecard, with their rocks. It's just a, it's a joy to watch. Yeah. Oh, look, that- and the level ten meeting is a is a game changer, no doubt. Yeah. The, you know, we've all been in so many meetings where we've sat around for, you know, one, two or three hours and you walk out and think, Well, hang on, what, what did we actually solve or what do we actually do? And the mm-hmm. you know, the, the clarity and the I suppose the prioritization uh, through the, the level ten and how effective they are. Um, yeah, that meeting format is a, is phenomenal once it's actually rolled out and it's a game changer. Yeah, I completely agree. So, but Guy, thinking back to your own business, what are the biggest challenges you faced in your business? Um, I think some of the, I'm at heart probably a bit of a perfectionist, so not not having things organised and, you know, my 
patience and sort of you know wanting to actually just wait for things to 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 roll out. Um, that's probably been my biggest pay, uh, one of my biggest challenges, making sure that you know there is an adequate time for actually things to happen or businesses to <laughs> you know ideas to sort of percolate and and roll through, um, and not just wanting them done you know straight away. So um, and I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges. Um, accepting help as well. Um, you know, there's always been I welcome help when, you know, I don't sort of shy away from it, but I'm I'm rare to actually ask people for help. So that's, you know, that's been a, a bit of a challenge for me as well because there's been so many times where, you know, you probably uh, duck on a pond and, you know, starting to sink and things aren't sort of organised or set up the way that you want to. But, uh, yeah, so... Perfectionism and, and asking for help. They're probably a couple of challenges that uh, I can relate to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I was just going to say, so do you consider yourself a visionary? Were you a visionary in your businesses? Um, probably more integrator, but the. Ah, okay. Yeah, the, the visionary, probably a dangerous visionary because of the, yeah, I mean, certainly traits are visionary as far as the ideas and where we need to go. But uh, yeah. execution is where I, I, I spend a lot of time. Um, and even now, no, truth be told, you know, I'm still grappling with, you know, uh, asking for help and, and doing things the right way as well. So, you know, it's a, I think it's a consistent journey that we're all on to improve as opposed to saying we're ever the, the best version of what we can do. So, yeah. yeah. But I did hear you say earlier on when we were chatting that you did get a mentor on board at some point. So what changed? How come you suddenly reached out and, and asked for help and got somebody to, to mentor you? Yeah, uh, good, good question. Yeah, so when I was studying, it was one of my leadership um, coaches or, um, yeah, professors that we sort of were working with and, yeah, that was a fundamental shift in um, she really pushed me and tested me um, as far as quite direct and quite firm, which uh, was a great approach that, you know, I, I could relate to. Um I was probably just floundering, you know, I didn't really, you know, we're at the stage of, of the business where we're, you know, um, 10 or so years in, um, wondering what's next. And, you know, I think she read it maybe through some of my papers that I was writing. So, yeah, we connected over a few coffees and, yeah, it was a great sort of to have that support and just someone to call for what it is, you know, and really uh, put me back on the straight and straight and narrow but yeah that was a great sort of uh, experience with her and still friends with her today so you know we catch up regularly um and uh yeah uh, really important person in my world yeah i want to explore the name of your business purpose people there's something behind that isn't there yeah. what is what is driving you these days yeah well i think purpose people for me what that means you know i, I love working with, be, with businesses and people that have got, you know, purpose and, and impacts that are baked into their uh, way of going about things. Um, I've had a, a little bit of exposure and experience within the B Corp community and uh, the B Corp uh, movement is really, the, the premise is, you know, that business can be a force for good. So, which I, I you know, do believe in strongly that, you know, people can have a successful business, it can be profitable, but it can also be, you know, uh, doing, you know, no harm along the way as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, purpose is making sure that, you know, that's that sort of connection back into, you know, what is the purpose and the actual output and the intent of the, the organisation, um, how people behave uh, and, and go about, you know, achieving their outcomes. Um, and, and that's what really draws me on. I'm, I'm really blessed and, and grateful for the opportunity with the, the clients that I'm working with now that they are fantastic businesses. They're, you know, doing the right things. They're, you know, willing to roll their sleeves up. Um, and, yeah, I, I just get a real joy and, and real kick out of helping them uh, day in, day out. I mean, it ties in with the whole EOS life thing too, doesn't it? I mean, it's all about making a huge difference in the world as well as doing what you love with people you love. Um, right. yeah. yeah. So tell me a little bit about the, the clients that you're working with and, and I, I suppose why do they even seek you out in the first place? Because mm -hmm. as you said before, asking for help can be quite difficult, um, but sometimes we all need a bit of help, right? We all need a bit of help to take us from uh, where we maybe feel like we've, we've hit the ceiling, we're stuck, we can't move forward. Yeah. Why would they seek you out in the first place and then what is it that you offer to them? Yeah, I think the, um, you know, people, are, the conversations that I'm having with people, you know, uh, I really relate with people that just are quite open and honest and, and, and wanting uh, support. 
the the type of people that are reaching out, it's it's primarily word of mouth. Um, you know, there's mm-hmm. like once you know, one person, and then you know the, the conversation sort of starts. So there's a lot of uh, um, just straight up support and, and advice. I, I love getting behind teams. Um, I'm quite humble, and you know, I'm not the you know the front of the stage person. I'm, I'm from behind. You know. Uh, supporting them, you know, catching them where they're, they're needed to be. Um, I'm available. You know, that's the other part. I love seeing the successes and small wins and, and touch base in between the times mm-hmm. with the clients that we work with. Um, geographically around the region here, there's so many fantastic businesses and founders that have actually created a business. And, you know, fast forward now, half a dozen years, they've got, you know, 50, 60, 70 people in their business and still trying to actually put the – the processes and structures in so yeah there's a lot of organizations that i'm working with now that are you know founder led organizations and i think the other part of it is the the variety of industries as well you know it's a real mix of services and manufacturing and um yeah there's no sort of common thread as far as the industries that i'm working with which is what i love and uh, and connecting the pieces uh, across different industries as well because it all comes back to people, you know, let's be honest. Yeah. That's the, uh, it all comes back to how you're managing and, and nurturing and caring for your team. Um, mm-hmm. That's the biggest common thread regardless of the industry. Yeah. And I think you, you know, I think you said it as people who kind of go into a business, you often find that they have, they've grown organically, their team has grown organically, and then they feel like they've kind of hit a ceiling because they just don't know how to move past what's grown organically into the, the areas they want to go into. And I think that's where EOS really comes into its own is giving you that structure, that discipline, that accountability that's to true. actually help you plan for the future and move forward. Yeah. I think allowing the the owners to actually let go of the vine as well. You know, there a lot yeah. of people. You know, they're they're still grappling and, and not able to sort of uh, hand off certain tasks or roles um, and and allow that sort of next level of their managers or supervisors to actually elevate. You know, uh, from there and give the the owners or the visionaries and integrators of the business, you know, uh, capacity to actually, you know, uh, lift the business up. Um, that's another factor of working through the accountability chart exercise where you've actually got that ability to, you know, share the roles and responsibilities and making sure that it's clear. Um, mm-hmm. There was one business owner that hadn't had a, a holiday or a substantial holiday for, you know, over a dozen years and, you um, Sitting in a, a visionary integrator and an operational uh, seat as well, and you know, working through that exercise, uh, we went through and you know, swapped him out some seats, and you know, uh, over a period of time, it wasn't a, a magic pill that happened overnight, as you know. But, no, yes, yeah, it was that sort of a delegation process that we went through over sort of you know six or so months, and yeah. He, he shot me an email over a Christmas saying that he'd actually had his first holiday, you know, without switching off for a, a, a long time. So it was a great uh, example about how it can actually impact and, and, and change. So, yeah. I think that's, that's really awesome. Well done. Yeah, I think that it's interesting, isn't it? So one of the things I've really loved about EOS is that this whole concept of visionary and integrator, I think that often in your own business, we end up playing both roles yes. and we don't understand there's a need to have somebody else to actually step in. And the accountability chart is very much about giving you an, an understanding of where the business is at and what all the seats are for the future. And then you can see how many hats you're wearing. Mm. And once you see how many hats you're wearing, it can be a bit of a wake up moment in terms wow. of, wow, okay, this can't continue so that's when you can start to actually really delegate for, for people who, who perhaps haven't um you know gone through the process just just use your own words to describe to me you know what the accountability chart is uh, what it does for the business how you've seen it work for the businesses you've worked with yep so the accountability chart it, it, it differs considerably from a traditional organization chart um it looks at the ideal structure for the organization for the coming six to 12 months. So, you know, if you're building the, i would describe it, if you're building the business from tomorrow onwards, what would be the ideal way that you would actually build the, the pieces of the business? Taking out the people for a moment, um, what is the ideal structure? And we sort of go through an exercise where you break that down into, you know, typically three components to start off with, sales and marketing, um, you know, finding a customer and, you know, converting them from a, a prospect through to a, uh, you know, validate a customer operation so where the actual product or service is delivered and then there's a finance uh, component as well and we tailor that towards you know, what the organization needs and that might split up into you know, three to five seats typically across a leadership team um, 
So the, the main the main functions of the business that are yeah, required. What are the pieces of the business that are actually you know are needed? Um, mm-hmm. and then we look at you know the, as you said the the differences between a visionary and an integrator, um, two very different roles, and, and really important to make sure that they're defined um, closely. So the integrator is someone who beats the drum of the organisation. They're you know clearing roadblocks for people on the leadership teams, you know, general manager, COO, you know, the titles are sort of interchangeable, but the actual role there is almost like, a, you know, looking at actually just getting things done with the organisation and, and holding it. And all holding it all together, right, yeah. making sure that we're not going off on tangents and bright, shiny lights and bright, shiny objects, yeah. Well, and, and if you think about that from a visionary perspective, you know, there I've known some amazing visionaries Um they have, you know, 200 odd years before breakfast, but they sort of, if they were in, in the seat of the integrator, you know, the business is going down one path this week and the next minute there's another idea that sort of comes back next week and we're, uh, you know, into another uh, sort of part. So, yeah, that's where organisations, and I've seen it, have, have had whiplash essentially because they don't know which way you're going um, and having that clarity between the actual two roles is, is really important. But I think what that does... Um, you know, providing that transparency and expectation of, you know, what, and, and also autonomy, you know, uh, once people know what's expected of them, I do believe that, you know, people want to actually come to work and have a fulfilled, be successful in their role. Um, quite often that comes from, you know, when they're, they're not uh, appearing to be, you know, successful, but it probably comes from a point of also not having clarity and transparency on what's expected of them as well. So, mm. you know, if you're giving people the tools and saying this is your role, how, how you know, what we expect out of you and vice versa, so what you expect from the business, um, you can have mutual wins. Um, I think sometimes when people don't know exactly what's expected of them, that's when they, they might be spending time in other areas that may not be what the actual business needs and that's the whole process of that transparency and setting up exactly what's actually needed, um, you know, of them as an employee and also a member of a, you know, um, a purpose-led business. Hmm. Okay, cool. So um, I always ask guests, you know, what are your kind of three top tips or tools, things that you've learned, things you wish you knew um, when you were running your business, whatever it might be, what would be the three things you would love to share, Ryan, with the listeners? Um, I've probably got some tips knowing that I'm not fully meeting them myself, to be honest. So I uh, <laughs> yeah, I love that. Yeah, <laughs> good. There's a lot of things. So I think, you know, accepting help, that, that's probably number yep. one. Um, mm. I said earlier, um, make, if people are willing to, to help you and also seeking out help when you think you, you know, you need it. Um, there, there's times as, as business owners we think we'll just keep powering on and, and keeping it going whilst we know that we're probably either out of our depth or, you know, maybe starting to sink a little bit, it's getting, you know, the water lines just creeping over the head. So, yeah, probably tip one is, you know, accepting help or seeking help when you uh, need it. Um, Can I just explore that a little bit further too? I mean, so, so when you – let's just say we are feeling a bit overwhelmed, we're feeling like it's all getting a bit too much. Um, how do you – how do you even reach out for help? And, and, you know, I know you said that you went to your lecturer at uni yeah. and that was somebody there. But if yeah. you don't have a lecturer at uni, what would you suggest people actually do? Yeah. Look, I mean, I think there's there's so many different opportunities for, you know, groups and advisory boards and, and other, um, I won't call them networking peer groups. Peer groups. Yeah, peer groups. Um, yep. You know, uh, areas where you've got, uh, I mean, industry forums, there's, there's so many different aspects of where you can actually seek help now. Chambers of Commerce, uh, EO, uh, Entrepreneurs Organisation is a great um, network, you know, sort of group for, for business owners. Um, you know, I, and I think even just within actual colleagues and suppliers as well. So you'd be surprised mm-hmm. on many times that, you know, it's not a competitive sort of arrangement. And I think you'd be surprised as soon as you start asking for help or, or just teasing out uh, ideas or fall yep. where that actually can come from so yeah. perfect love it okay cool yep, yep. number two um probably uh and this is the one that i'm even now saying that i know that i don't follow myself but accepting that it's okay for uh time away from the business for yourself um so self-care time uh-huh. so you know that's uh you know, allowing yourself, you know, permission and not feeling that guilt when you do take time out of the business. Um, 
you know, with whatever that means for you, you know, that's obviously individual for, um, you know, everyone's different of what their, their, their time away means, whether that's, you know, uh, activities, gym, mindfulness, meditation, sports, fishing, reading, time with family. I mean, it's just not feeling that guilt when you actually do take that time out of the business. Um, mm-hmm. I've got better at it, but I, I'm probably like a, a six out of ten, you know, compared to what I could be. So, um, yeah. and actually, that's a really good point. I love that. I think actually having some kind of scale where you can go, "Hey, look, none of us is perfect. We've all got room to improve." But being able to say on that scale of one to ten, where do you sit? And, yeah. and we all go up and down as well, right? Yeah. I think at the moment, um, I'm probably feeling like that's probably about a five out of ten for me. But yeah. I know there've been times it's been an eight out of ten. So, yeah. I think using scales like that to go, actually, yeah. where am I at? What could I do to improve it? Yeah. Um, but you absolutely right I mean if you don't it's like the um Gino talks about it in the EOS life and he talks about managing your energy it's like a glass of water that has got some dirt in it if you're yeah. continuously moving which is being in the business all the time yeah. that glass of water is continuously cloudy it's not yeah. until you actually kind of take some time out and let the glass the, the, sorry, the dirt settle yeah. that you get clarity of what's going on and that's that's a good thing yeah so true. I mean, I've, I've started scheduling, you know, time in the calendar and putting it on my own personal scorecard, you know, how many, mm-hmm. uh, how much time I'm actually spending doing that, knowing that I'm not quite where I need to be, but I know that I feel better after I do. You know? So, yeah. Um, but yeah, the glass of water is a great, great visualisation that it is just murky and muddy and you just need to take, let, let time to help it settle and then you can, uh, yeah, think you get clarity on that. Yeah. It's the oxygen mask concept, right? If you're not looking after yourself, then how can you possibly help others? Yeah. Very true, very true. Yeah, yeah. cool. Yeah. And yeah. tip number three? I think the tip number three is probably really within that connection to the people in your business as well, um, thinking about mm-hmm. what's meaningful for them, um, knowing that you're, you know, providing a support, you know, but they're an opportunity, but that's goes both ways, you know. Uh, I think... Some people are looking at purely career progression. Some are looking at, you know, commercial returns. Some are looking at time and balance. Um, some are looking at education. So really that sort of connection to the, the, the people in your business and coming from a point of, of actually caring, not just saying you're caring and, you know, not, not demonstrating. So I think people see through that, um, you know, quite easily uh, and making sure you've got that ability to actually work out what's important for your people and, yeah, providing those opportunities. And, and if you can't do it immediately, explaining and, and providing that sort of pathway that, that sort of shows that someone can actually, you know, you can both reach sort of mutual outcomes. So, um, yeah. And I think one of the tools that EOS has for that, those quarterly conversations with people are, are really important. You know, and it's not a formal structured um, performance review, but it's just having a conversation about what's working, what's not working, where are you headed, what do you want to do? And um, yeah. as you said, being able to set expectations around what's possible, what's not, I think is really, really important. Yeah, and I think most people understand that, you know, as long as they're, you know, provided the opportunity you can have the the informal discussions but you know and people can see progress and, and changes or at least just understand if things can't happen i think most people are reasonable to understand that you know look back the last few years it's been a bit of a tumultuous sort of time for everyone and you know yeah. people are recovering and coming back but i think what where it gets sort of astray is when there's no conversations or there's that sort of superficial level of conversation um you know i think people just appreciate hearing the truth and, and and also understanding it from that perspective so yeah depth of connection is probably the the third tip that uh, i've really found that and that's satisfying on both fronts you know um mm-hmm. allows you to actually have deeper connection with people but also you know they're they're having a a better experience and you know mutual outcomes which is which is what i try to do in all sort of conversations and that's not just a, a one-sided street really so yeah no, that's fantastic okay ryan um Pleasure to talk to you as always. I want to know now from um, people who are listening in who might kind of go, hey, look, I could do with some help. I'd love to have a chat with Ryan. Tell me a little bit about what your ideal kind of client looks like and then where people can actually find you. Yeah, sure. Um, Look, my ideal client, I I work between uh, Melbourne, Sydney, Northern Rivers and also Brisbane. So, yeah, there's a a fair bit of travel that's involved. Um, I love working with sort of fan-led organisations that are getting to a stage now that they're just trying to, they're working out what's next for them. So, you know, the uh, ideal um, 
sort of market that I've been, uh, you know, the, the, well, I don't have a, a, a specific industry. Um, there's a, a range of different industries that we work with, but yeah, finding me through LinkedIn um, or the EOS microsite are the two uh, main locations, uh, which is off the EO. Uh, S, uh, worldwide website um yep. yeah the, we'll pop that link in the actual um, the in the, the, um, um yep but yeah really just people that are you know needing help and and wanting sort of that level of support and someone sort of in their corner to to help them um you know that's where my sort of ideal work comes from is really making sure that i can you know get in with the team i love being involved with, with the businesses and, and helping in a genuine way so and as, as, of course, as EOS implementers, we offer that opportunity to kind of spend 90 minutes with us and just understand the EOS model, the EOS tools, and make sure there's a real fit as well for the for the person yeah. you want to work with. So um, yeah. they can contact you and book in for that 90-minute Absolutely. meeting, right? Yeah, I've yeah. actually got two today. So I'm looking forward to ah, excellent. Uh, yeah, sharing uh, some time uh, with some people. And, uh, yeah, no, it's going to be fun. So, and, and I think yeah. that's the whole point. It's just that awareness and, and understanding about what EOS is and how it can help them. So, and that's what I love doing is, is, is sharing that uh, experience with people. You and me both. That's great. Hey, look, Ryan, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure to talk to you as always. Look forward to seeing you in Sydney um, tomorrow or Wednesday, whatever it is. Yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. 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 Sounds good. Thank you for having me, Deborah. Deborah, much appreciated. So, yeah. Oh, absolute pleasure. Yeah. Thank you.